In this quick education tutorial, we will look at the leaf and spine data center design architecture. We know this is designed to be a considerable step up from the traditional data center design. As a use case, we will focus on how Cisco has adopted the leaf and spine design with the Cisco ACI product. We will address some of the key components involved and how they form the ACI fabric. So after this education tutorial, you will have a general idea of the architecture of the leaf and spine and how the Cisco ACI operates. So with a non-leaf and spine data set design, this is commonly known as a three-tier model. We were getting hit by core port count along with general scalability and performance problems. The three-tier design was not built for east to west traffic flow. Then came along the leaf and spine architecture that focused on a fabric approach to data set design. There was better load bouncing end to end and the non-blocking architecture was better suited for today's applications. And when it came to, for example, the Cisco ACI, it really did bar the concepts of SDN. Where we had a lot of intelligence in the central location and the main role was to build the paths necessary for the data plane forwarding. So there's a spiner that represents the core layer and generally you would have two spines for high availability. There is also a leaf there in which the endpoints connect to. You could have a remote office as an endpoint or even a container. Equidistant endpoints are where any pair of endpoints get the same average end-to-end -end bandwidth. The leaf and spine fabric is perfectly symmetrical with every leaf switch is connected to every spine with uplinks that can uniform the bandwidth. So let us go back to the Cisco ACI example and here we have a number of key components. The first major component would be the VTEP. The VXLAN tunnel endpoint is responsible for encapsulating and de-encapsulating traffic. Many refer to this device as a connection between the overlay and the underlay network. Every spine will have a VTEP and every leaf will have a VTEP too. The spine VTEP is a bit more special than the leaf VTEP as all the leaves need to go to the spine when they don't know the destination. And this is where the spine will have a special anycast address. This is where the Coop database comes to play and is held only on the spines and is synchronized between spines when you have more than one spine in your architecture. Council of Oracle Protocol, also known as COOP, is used to communicate the mapping information, which is the location and identity, to the spine proxy. So the leaf switch forwards endpoint address information to the spine switch using zero message queue. So VXLAN in the ACI is an industry standard protocol that allows you to extend layer two segments over layer three infrastructure that allows you to build this overlay network. So VXLAN is most commonly used protocol in data set designs and it's used to create overlay networks that sit on top of the physical underlay, extending these virtual networks. Then we have IGP of ISIS, which is used for VXLAN reachability. So we have ISIS as the IGP for the VTEPs. And finally, Cisco ACI forwards multicast frames on the overlay multicast three that is built between the leaf and spine switches. In this case, layer two traffic uses a forwarding tree, which is known as an F tag tree to provide efficient load balancing across redundant same cost links. Finally, I want to summarize some of the key leaf and spine data set design points. The spine leaf architecture minimizes latency and bottlenecks because each payload only has to travel to the spine layer and another leaf switch to reach its endpoint. Spine switches now can have a really high port count density and form the core of the architecture. So we know that the three tier data center design really was limited by core layer when it came to port count density. Switches in a spine layer architecture can also help with scaling and now we can build massive data set designs while maintaining great performance. Actually, before I finish up, I just want to touch on one quick point. 
as traffic enters the fabric, ACLI encapsulates and applies policy to it and then forwards it where needed across the fabric to the spine layer and then decapsulate it when it exits the fabric. So within the fabric, ACI uses ISIS as IGP and also the COOP for all forwarding of endpoint endpoint communications. And we've spoken about how this COOP database is synchronized across all the spines. So this enables ACI links to be active and provide equal cost multipath forwarding in the fabric along with really fast reconverging. So all traffic in the ACI fabric is normalized as VXLAN packets. ACI encapsulates external VLAN, VXLAN and NVGRE packets into VXLAN packets at ingress. So this normalization of traffic neutralizes traffic and now we can have bridge domains and VRFs. A bridge domain is a layer two forwarding construct within the fabric that defines the flooding domain for you. So you're probably thinking, is that not just like a VLAN? And you'd be right, except the bridge domains are not subject to many of the same limitations as the VLAN construct is. So then we have the VRF construct and the VRF in ACI really is identical to the VRF you're used to in traditional networking. It contains things like layer three routing instances, tables and IP addresses. So in this quick educational tutorial, we looked at the leaf and spine data center architecture. We know this design is a considerable step up from the traditional data center design. As a use case, we focus on how Cisco ACI has adopted the leaf and spine design with the Cisco ACI product. We then address some of the components involved and how they form this ACI fabric. You now should have a general idea of the architecture of the leaf and spine and how Cisco operates with this architecture.